Thanks, Joe. Thanks a lot. That was excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> so I guess uh, while they're getting the slides up, um, I'll say thanks to Joe. Uh, I, you know, Joe's followership on LinkedIn makes mine look futile. He's got like 3x or 4x what I have. And he, um, I told him he got through the toughest gate at ResMed, which is my assistant, Dawn Painter. She lets no one through. And she let Joe through two years ago. She said, he's such a nice guy. I set up the conference and I was going to come and speak. And then Zimmer moved there. Uh, it was Zimmer at the time. They hadn't bought Biomet yet. Moved their board meeting. I said, Joe, I'm really sorry. This time he said, it's in your hometown. You know, you can drive from home to it. And I'm really excited to be here. And I love this community of um, medical device folks that you've set up here. And I hope I'd have a one on my, um, uh, what's the volume there, guys? I'd have a one on my, uh, on my badge if I had one. I hope to have a two, three, or four, or five as, as this conference continues to grow. My goal uh, today in my talk is to provide um, ResMed as a case study in connected care and digital health. Uh, at ResMed, we have a triple aim, and our triple aim is to lower healthcare costs for a global sick care system and make it a healthcare system. Two, to slow the progression of chronic disease, not just sleep apnea and COPD and neuromuscular disease, the ones we are in now, but many others as well. And our third part of the triple aim is to improve patient outcomes, one patient at a time. So why is ResMed a useful or viable case study? Well, judge for yourselves at the end of this little talk. And by the way, this is a conversation I'm gonna do. I think we have an hour, a little less now maybe with the startup, but uh, I'm gonna try to make it 50% uh, get stuff out there and 50% let's have a Q&A and have a dialogue. Um, there's a little microphone on me that's going for the webcast, so I'll repeat your questions for the, for the folks on the web. Um, but we have 3 million 100% cloud-connected medical devices. They don't sometimes connect. They have a cell phone chip in them with 99% coverage. We get data to the cloud every day. We now have over 1 billion nights of sleep data. Uh, we're lowering costs for sleep apnea and COPD therapy set up by over 50%. And we're increasing adherence from baselines in our industry of 50, 60% to 80, 90%. Stuff that my pharmaceutical colleagues uh, dream of having. Okay, so a little background on, on ResMed, and we'll see if the sound works. And if it doesn't, I'm gonna fake snoring and apnea sounds on these mics for you. Uh, first, a show of hands. Who in this audience has heard of sleep apnea? Okay, for those on the webcast, that's about 95%. So I've been with the company 17 years. If I'd asked that question in 2000 when I just joined from uh, Genzyme, it would have been about 5 to 10% of the audience. I'm not kidding. Uh, awareness has uh, really gone up. That's good. Okay, who here knows someone on sleep apnea therapy? Okay, I'd say it's about 60% for those on the web. Um, who here is on CPAP therapy themselves. If you don't mind breaking HIPAA laws for yourself. There's about five of us, six, seven, seven of us. Okay, keep your hand up if you use CPAP every night, including last night. Okay, so there's four hands left up. I'm gonna show you what happens when you have sleep apnea that's not treated. Tell me when the video's running because I can't see Jack from here. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the uh, Mick Farrell impression of a sleep apnea patient. Just put the slide up of that, that gentleman. Okay, so this is a husband whose wife cared for him so much. Oh, it's moving now, okay. Whose husband cared for him so much that she outed him. He denied he suffocated, he denied, because he was asleep, he didn't know he was suffocating multiple times per night. He denied that he'd stopped breathing because he didn't know it. He was in subconscious state, he was in REM sleep or deep sleep, not for long, because the reason this gentleman, I can't see where you're up to in it, but I bet you there's a whole lot of <coughs> shaking and he's probably got a couple of <coughs> snores there and then there'll be this sound, which is the deadliest one that the wife, the reason she outed him is <coughs> I can't even do the full 10 seconds. 10 seconds is the minimum to be in apnea. And the reason he doesn't die from that suffocation is because, you know the movie Pulp Fiction where Uma Thurman gets that needle stabbed into her? It's that surge of adrenaline 
and norepinephrine and neurohormones, boatloads of neurohormones that your body sends through your system, a fight or flight response that says, the woolly mammoth's coming, I've got to get out of here. But you're supposed to be sleeping. And to be clinically significant, that has to happen more than five times per hour to 15. That's what they call mild apnea. Right? That means between every four to 12 minutes you suffocate. That's mild. Moderate is suffocating every two to five minutes. What they call severe sleep apnea means you suffocate every minute or two or less. Sometimes every 60 seconds, 60, an AHI of 60. Um, they call it an AHI, I call it the suffocation index. Okay, let's move on to the, to the next slide now. So what does that cause, this pulp fiction neurohormone injection? Uh, it leads to all sorts of complications. It impacts the heart, it impacts the metabolic syndrome. Um, I think we should be on the next slide. Yeah, let's just leave it there. Um, it impacts the, the cardiovascular system. 50% of heart failure patients have sleep apnea. 70% to 80% of drug-resistant hypertension patients, right? If you have hypertension, you're on two, or meds, two meds or more, still not under 120 over 80, you've got an 80% chance of having sleep apnea. And if it remains untreated, your outlook is a lot worse. There's a study called the Sleep Heart Health Study from the University of Wisconsin. Terry Young and her colleagues, she's the head epidemiologist, has run this for over a decade. And their data show that over 26% of 30 to 70 year olds have sleep apnea. So 40 to 60 million Americans. And we have less than five to six million of them under treatment. Sometimes people don't go to treatment because they're scared of the therapy. This is the therapy when Colin Sullivan, who's the inventor of CPAP from the University of Sydney was working on it. This is a Japanese Hitachi blower that's loud enough to sound like your swimming pool pump. Not your current one, but the one you had 10 years ago. And the mask that they used on the first patients was the size of a toilet seat, like a Rube Goldberg device. And it was glued on your face every night. I'm not kidding, glued on your face. And my father, who founded ResMed, it was actually an MBO from Baxter Healthcare. He bought the technology for $2 million. I checked the stock price today, we're 9.7 billion, so it's not a bad return over a couple of decades. Um, but that technology uh, was pretty fundamentally sound, right? A pneumatic stent. Just simply let's have a pneumatic stent and keep this airway open and let the patient breathe. But Eddie Merck, who was that first patient that my father met, my dad said to him, why do you do this? It's loud. And he said, oh, it's not a big deal. I put the machine in the garage and then I have a tube that comes through to my bedroom. He's like, what? Like, and what do you do with the glue? He said, oh, just shower a little longer, rip it off. He said, well, why in God's name, on God's green earth, would you use that thing every night. And he said, it saved my job, it saved my marriage, it saved my life. And my dad said, oh, those sound like pretty important things. And um, I think I can make the device a little smaller. And we have. Um, this is our latest technology. It's called the Air Curve 10. It's the bedside table device, if you like. This thing's quieter than, well quieter than that air conditioning system we have in this room now. It's less than 24 decibels. It's best for the spouse because she hears nothing. Not the, <sighs> the reason people out their husbands is because that happens. And by the way, 40% of the patients showing up for diagnostics now are female. We have a whole line of for her algorithms because women breathe differently for her masks because some people have hair and they like to have it looked after and there's different needs of our different gender groups. So um, we are making these things smaller, quieter and more comfortable. Uh, but more importantly uh, for this talk, we're making them more connected. By the way, I use a mask myself every night that's the size of my little finger here. It's called the uh, P10 for nasal pillows. It fits like there right under my nose and just forms a seal around my nose. And unless you're a mouth breather, which is about 30% of you, um, for the 70% of us, that's enough. These things are just like nasal cannulas now. This one actually does non-invasive ventilation. So this will treat COPD, neuromuscular disease and others. Um, but I'm not here to talk about that. One other thing I'm not here to talk about is our latest technology, but I can't help myself. We've been waiting for 27 years for this. ResMed's turning 28 next month, and we've created, uh, when I say we, I mean hundreds of engineers in Sydney and Singapore and Munich, have created the world's smallest CPAP. Uh, this thing is about the size of two of my clickers together. This thing fits in your pocket. It's about five inches by three inches by two inches. It's less than 0.7 pounds. So less than about 300 grams for those of us who use the metric system. 
And I've been using a prototype of this device while traveling around the world. We do business in 100 countries. I like to get to a lot of them as often as possible, ask my wife. And I travel with this device, and it saved my job, saved my marriage, saved my life while I've been on the road. So this thing is taking pre-orders from our customers this month, and we're going we're to start shipping by, by May 31st. I'm, I'm really excited about it. But this is what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about a broken healthcare system, how healthcare, and I worked in steel and chemicals, and biochemicals and then biotech before I ended up in med tech. And we are one of the most inefficient industries on the planet. We create paperwork like we want it. We create bureaucracy like it's amazing. We run a sick care system where frequent flyers at the hospital, up until the ACOs, were frequently rewarded. And we have incredible inefficiencies of people trying to get through the diagnostic system. This is what life looked like for our customers. They have this rule in sleep apnea therapy in the United States, which is when you get prescribed a device, you have to use it more than four hours a night for more than 70% of the nights for more than 30 days in a row within your first 90 days of therapy, or they take the therapy away. It's archaic. It's like Darwinian play. Imagine the diabetic. I'm sorry, you didn't use it for three months. No more diabetes treatment for you. No more soup for you. That's exactly what they do with sleep apnea therapy. 90 days, you get cut off, and you have to wait five more years and then do another diagnostic, try and get through it. So our customers were busy trying to record all this, and we had sneaker net, these little SD cards, and asking people to hook up Wi-Fi or their own Bluetooth, and they weren't doing it. So we said, we're not going to accept that, and we put a chip inside every box. Before going into what we were doing to it, this is the healthcare system. You'll notice the patient is not at the centre of it. Eric Topol, just up the road here, cardiologist, a big advocate for the patient will see you now, would be very upset, but this is the current system. And I'm going to click forward. I'm not going to click through all these lines. They'll do it themselves, but this, these are the steps. Every single one of these lines has to happen for you to get diagnosed and treated with sleep apnea in this country. 10, 20, 30 steps. So the the fact that when we went from 95% of the hands or 26% of the population down to the 10%, maybe 15% that we've got on treatment is this, is this broken system. So I was just up in Silicon Valley uh, last week. Um, I met Ben Horowitz and Mark Andreessen from Andreessen Horowitz and spent a lot of time at a number of the other big tech companies. And when you walk into Andreessen Horowitz, the first thing you see is a piece of artwork that says software will eat the world. And they're right. Uber has eaten every taxi company. Netflix ate Blockbuster. Airbnb has eaten almost every hotel chain's modest and low end. We decided that we weren't going to become the taxi company or Blockbuster, and we decided to be more like Amazon, who put a chip inside every little book reader and you didn't even know it was going to the cloud. You just wanted a book and you bought it for $9.99. So we changed the basis of competition in our industry from smaller, quieter, and more comfortable to smaller, quieter, more comfortable, and more connected. We now put a wireless communications chip that requires the patient to do nothing inside every single sleep apnea and every single COPD device that we sell. And we turned all that nightmare of that spider web into an end-to-end -end solution for our customers whether you need document management, inventory management, prescription management, care flow management, revenue cycle management, or you want to reach out to your patients, call them, email them, text them, gamify them. We do it all on the cloud and we do it all for our customers. We didn't invent it all ourselves. We made a couple of acquisitions on the way. We bought a company called Umbian up in Halifax, Nova Scotia. You say, why Halifax? Well, there's a little company called BlackBerry there. They were losing some share, and they had a boatload of great cloud software engineers at about half the price of Silicon Valley, about three quarters of the price of San Diego, and they're really good, and they're excellent at security. BlackBerry was always the leader in security, and so those folks have joined Resmin, and we now have a couple hundred software engineers up there running uh, part of our cloud. The other acquisition we made was a company in Atlanta called Brighttree, and it's about a year ago today that we closed. And we invested $800 million, and our market cap at the time was $8 billion. So it was 10% of our market cap, a 10% better the farm on software as a service for our customers. And all Brighttree did 
was home medical equipment, who are our customers, distributors of medical equipment, called HME or DME. HME, DME company, Careflow Automation. And we've automated all the steps and it's all in the cloud, per user, per month. And I've got to tell you, having spent you know, 10 years running a commercial division where 10 years is really 40 quarters, I had to beg, I had to beg for revenue every quarter with a medical device play, right? You're begging for the quarter, can, can we please, can you please buy again? Software as a service, it's beautiful. Annual recurring revenue, monthly recurring revenue. The customers love it so much that they don't want to change. And you add features and you can say, well, do you want to take a price increase? Okay, then we won't add the new features for you. It's a really exciting play and our customers have loved it. We've liberated the data and we've unlocked value for those customers, the providers. We've lowered their costs, so I'll show you some studies by 50%. For patients, we've liberated data and unlocked it to them. They get it on their smartphones now. For physicians, they can do management by exception. For payers, they can run uh, care management programs, distributed health programs with the data in their own Epic or Cerner system. So we have an API that can flow into anybody's system. We've done it with Kaiser, we've done it with many of the big players. So I'll do a little drill down on some of, the, some of those areas of value. Um, this is AirView, so this is our physician uh, management software program. So if you've got thousands of sleep apnea patients, which mo most doctors do, you can't manage them all. So we put them into risk groups, those at high risk of losing therapy, those at moderate risk, and those who actually don't need any follow-up and help the nurse and help the physician's assistant and help the respiratory care technician triage those. We also run cloud-based algorithms that work out how best to email, text, or IVR directly to those patients. And you know how we find out? It's crazy in healthcare. We ask the patient, who's actually a consumer, we say, how would you like to be contacted? And how often would you like to be contacted? And look, you know, click here. I agree, if you'd like ResMed to be able to contact you. The agreement rates are through the roof. Patients are screaming for their own data. The doctor doesn't always know best because the doctor can't be across all those patients. The doctor knows best when the patient comes to them with symptoms and problems. and They don't want to deal with the frivolous questions and the computer system doesn't mind dealing with those frivolous, seemingly frivolous patients because none of them of the questions are frivolous because if they don't get the answer, they might not use the therapy. They might not stay at a hospital. They might have an earlier heart attack or stroke which are the consequences of untreated suffocation. So here's some peer-reviewed published evidence on this. This is from the American Thoracic Society. This is a study we did with um, Kaiser Permanente of Southern California. Um, and the, by the way, the payer providers, whether it's Geisinger, Intermountain Health, or Kaiser, they are the future. I mean, this idea that when a patient leaves the hospital, they're not important or the idea that when they leave my primary care practice, they're not important. It's a continuum and it needs to be seen as that. You know, one of the best elements of the Affordable Care Act was the accountable care organisations. I think there were a lot of flaws with it, but that was a really good part. The ACOs or something like that needs to be there because nobody wants to be in hospital. The patient doesn't want to be in hospital. The doctor doesn't want you there in hospital. The, the payer doesn't want you in hospital. It's expensive. And under an ACO or in Kaiser, the hospital CEO doesn't want you in the hospital. All those things should be aligned because hospitals are where sick people go, healthy people should be at home, well taken care of with a good quality of life. And our goal is, you know, let's, let's look for the five nines that Microsoft and Google look for. Let's get those five nines if we can on healthcare. That would save the trillions of dollars. But in this study, we were able to show that we could not only lower the cost of therapy set up for Kaiser Permanente, but we increased adherence by 21% just by an algorithm talking to patients. 21% relative improvement in adherence. And if you talk to Dr. Huang who ran the study, he would tell you it's one of the toughest things to get. Heated humidification, education programs, smaller, quieter, more comfortable, threatening people with the stick of uh, heart attacks or strokes, or for males, you know, all your testosterone is released during REM sleep. If you don't get REM sleep, you'll be on Cialis, so use this device. All those threats don't work for patients. What works is encouraging them, gamifying them, giving them their own data. This is another study uh, that we did with a company called Sleep Data, and they showed uh, pretty clearly a almost 60% reduction in uh, their clinicians' labor costs. 
So in the United States, that means more profit for a, for a distributor. In the UK, where we also sell to the National Health Service or the government of Norway, where we have 80% share, it means more efficiency. Under socialised medicine, there are these huge lines for people to get through the system. If you increase efficiency by 59%, more patients get treated. And the government's like that because they've actually run the numbers and they realise that treating patients at home with a respiratory device for sleep apnea is cheaper than having them be a frequent flyer in the ER. In COPD, it goes to, goes to another level with that. So I talked about the gamification, you know, how do we do it? We give a score out of 100. You know, it's like your, your Fitbit or your Apple Watch giving you your 10,000 steps. Who knew 10,000 was right? Everyone's talking about it, right? How am I going to get my steps? How am I going to get more fit? All the people running the, the exercise bikes, the Garmin and, and tracking themselves. I like to compare myself to other 45-year-old males in Southern California, a competitive guy. I only slept seven hours and five minutes last night. The average 45-year-old slept seven hours 30. That's not good. My score is 85. I need a 90. What am I going to do about that? The system gives me hints. Drink some more water this afternoon, Mick. Have a, have a 15 to 20 minute exercise today. Not an hour and not five minutes, 15 to 20. And it tells me. And it's all based on clinical data and research and adapting to me. The cloud algorithm adapts and learns from the patient and from the literature. And it works. So what do we get from all that? We get a boatload of data. Everybody's talking about big data. Big data is useless. Big data is useless. What's useful is actionable information. And what's really useful is actionable information that actually changes an outcome. So mining those data for the right analytics, tuning it up for that patient at that time is the future and we're not done. The reason I was up in Silicon Valley is we're, not, we're the world's experts in treating sleep apnea. We're the world's experts in treating COPD. There's another company in town, Dexcom. They're the world's experts in treating type 1 and future type 2 diabetes. But those data need to be put together. And then we need a system that can be the Facebook for health, the health book. We'd actually trust that those data could be looked at and analysed and given back to you. Um, it's going to need very high level trust and I don't know which Zuckerberg is pulling out of Harvard right now to create it. Uh, it might come out of MIT, I think, frankly. Um, I'm biased, though. Um, but somebody's going to do that, and uh, we can't wait. We've got the APIs already. We don't have a data lake, but we have data wells. We have a well of sleep apnea data. We have a well of COPD data. Someone else has got a well of cardiovascular data, like Medtronic, some of you guys. Uh, someone else has got a data well in diabetes. Including, including Dexcom and others, and we need to put those data together. So we have over 3 million patients on the 100% cloud-connected medical devices. We have 5 million patients where we're getting data through various sources, the old sneaker net and cards as well. We have 45 million patient records in uh, the Brighttree uh, purchase, where we can see some transactions for virtually everything that these patients do that's out of hospital care by linking up those billion nights of sleep data, that, those data wells around sleep apnea and COPD, we think we can not only change the field of respiratory medicine, but uh, so ResMed stands for respiratory medicine, but we think we can be a big part of all out of hospital care. So ResMed might actually in the future be residential medicine because we think that software as a service not only for uh, where we're playing now in HME, but also in home health, hospice, skilled nursing facilities and long-term acute care is, is the future and we want to be part of that and partnering up with the, the hospital system to, to make sure that works. Just before I leave the, the big data and turn it into actionable information, we just published a study uh, last week, maybe the week before, at the European Respiratory Society Conference, ERS is the acronym, and it was a study which is the largest that's ever been done in the field of respiratory medicine. The sleep heart health study I was talking about earlier, 4,000 patients, it's like the Framingham heart study for respiratory medicine, it's huge. We did a study with 200,000 patients, 200,000 patients, and we looked at a prospective, and we did a retrospective, and then we did a prospective study. And we looked at basic care, which is CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, basic sleep apnea care, and then we looked for these 
central sleep apneas, where the brain stem, you actually breathe because of CO2 and a chemical sensor in the back of your uh, brain stem here looking for CO2. So it's doing an inverse, it's a weird design, God, but he's looking at CO2 and saying, okay, how do I breathe? But if that CO2 receptor goes off, if that bloodstream sensor goes off, you just stop breathing. And your airway's fully open and our device is keeping it fully open saying, come on, and you don't breathe. It's called treatment emergent central sleep apnea. If we see that, we need to upgrade you to an adaptive servo ventilator. ResMed's proprietary treatment is then actually able to breathe for you. We notice it, we see the airways open, little, you know, we just send a little sonar down, literally, and see the lungs are all open. We go, well, hold on, your lungs are open, it's been 60 seconds, it's your normal respiratory rate, and then we start breathing for you. What we found in this 200,000 patient study is that when we moved and found that tre uh, treatment emergent central sleep apnea and treated it, we not only lowered the suffocation index, we also improved adherence for the patients. So there was a quality of life improvement as well as a reduction in pain and, and, um, and suffering for the patient and um, yeah, economic impact on the healthcare system for untreated apneas. So when I get up um, in front of our team and say, oh, it's great, you know, ResMed just achieved two billion in revenues and we're almost 10 billion in market cap, it's kind of like, eh, go. Because they, they didn't come to work for Goldman Sachs. They came to work for ResMed. When I get up and say, in the last 12 months, we changed over 11 million lives. And because I'm an engineer, maybe a recovering engineer, um, I believe that you actually have to provide a product to someone. You can't just say, I changed your life because you logged on my website, or I changed your life because you logged onto my air. So we delivered over 11 million products that helped people breathe. So we gave the gift of breath to 11 million people in the last 12 months. And our goal uh, at ResMed is to turn that into 20 million by 2020. Because it's nice alliteration and also with good double digit volume growth, um, we'll be able to get there. So thanks a lot for your time and I'll now open up to any questions. Obviously, an innovator, you're a first mover, you have seized both miniaturization and digitization. What has that done for your numbers? What can you tie to these initiatives to what percent of your growth or numbers? And because I think for the audience who will watch this later, it'll be an inspiration. Oftentimes, I'll run into manufacturers who say, I get it, these are the trends, but Right now, I have to get this water or something like that. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's tough because that's all based upon a lot of market research. We, we ask customers, you know, why did you choose ResMed over our competitors? Um, that moment of truth, that moment where they signed the purchase order for ResMed or one of our competitors, how did they make that choice? And we do a lot of research into that. And we actually have a lot more big data on that that we turn into actionable information for our marketing folks. Um, I'll, I'll give you this anecdote, this, this analogy, you know, ResMed was born global. I was born in Seattle, actually. I was born in um, Mercer Island, Group Health, and uh, I grew up in South Seattle, actually Australia. Um, th that's the accent. Uh, but, um, you know, as I, as, I look at, um, as I look at our company and um, what uh, we've achieved by um, by being born global, right? The company was started in, in Sydney, Australia by my father before it IPO'd. He had to move over here in 2000, uh, 1995 when it IPO'd on NASDAQ and had to, I have to live here because I'm an NYSC listed company, but I wouldn't live anywhere else. We're in the hub of MedTech here. But anyway, the anecdote is because we were, the company was born in a little island of 20 million, well, a big island, but with a small population of 20 million in Asia Pacific, uh, we had to reach out to the billions around the world. And so we were always number one share in Asia Pacific, near our you know, homeland of Australia, so Japan, China. Um, and we're, we were number one in emerging markets like India. Um, we were number one in Europe, in Germany and France and the UK, because we were there first and really reached out there. We had a competitor on the East Coast of the US that was always number one here uh, in market share. We were the number one in innovation the whole way, I believe. I'm biased. Uh, we took number one share in the US only after we 
it not only embraced the digital revolution, that we actually lived it and drove it and led it within our industry. So we were always taking share by making things smaller, quieter, more comfortable. But we finally became the number one market share player globally, particularly in the biggest volume market, the United States, by embracing the digital side of it and putting a chip in every single box, not asking our customers, our patients, to do anything. You ask a patient to do something, 50% of the time, they won't do it. We just, we've got other things to do. We're living our lives. I don't want to spend time on the medical device. It should just work. Just have it work. Um, but that's the anecdote I'd use. Miniaturization got us, you know, number one uh, in Asia Pacific and, and Europe. Digital got us number one in, in the US and North America. Thank you. We're all forward and also thinking toward the, looking forward to digitalization. The question is how did your company embrace the hip hop and how did the patients react to data being digitalized and or their hip hop concerns from their end? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, there are some really important things. And by the way, we'd been taking data to doctors for 10 years before uh, we did it primarily through cellular, 3G, 4G, 5G wireless. We had SD cards and downloadable devices for over a decade. And, um, you know, I, I look at the, uh, the I agree rates from consumers who have been diagnosed with a disease, right? They're not just patients, they're also consumers. And, and you just look at you know, how Joe and I met on a, on a social network, on a, on a business network, LinkedIn, right? Um, and I'm not a millennial, I'm a clear Gen X plus-ish. Um, and so I don't do Facebook, by the way, but you do not need to see a public company CEO on Facebook. But I love being on LinkedIn and I love reaching out to patients. I love it when they make bad or good comments and interacting with them. Patients, including Gen X and you know, baby boomers and actually retirees, click I agree to having my data in the cloud so that my doctor can get it, so that I can get it, um, and I can liberate it at a very high rate. I won't, because I think there's some competitors in the audience and there certainly will be listening, release the exact amounts, but I've got to tell you, I think there's a lot of trust people have. I click I agree on Apple a lot because I really, you know, I trust Tim Cook and I trust Apple to actually preserve my privacy on, on my sort of consumer side. I, I hope we've generated that trust with, with our, our, our um, patients. And look, you know, it's, it's a work in process, making sure you've got good cyber security and all that and everything can be hacked and everything can be um, pulled apart and you've seen it in, uh, you know, United Healthcare and eBay and Target and the federal government, Department of Defense, uh, names and social security numbers and all their children and families for the top 200 spies in the country. Everything can be taken. Um, but patients want their data. You know, they're putting photos of themselves up all over social media. If you can give them information every day that helps them get more personal with their therapy, get more engaged with their therapy, they love it. But it's a huge investment for us and it's something that's an ongoing game and something that we really treat with a lot of care and a lot of sort of productive paranoia. Uh, yes, go ahead. You come to Jake Vanders in. I just, first of all, as a patient, I feel like I owe you a check because I learned more from you tonight than I did ever from my doctor when I was diagnosed. I'm curious though, with so much work that you've done and leading the way in digital, What's going on with your company with artificial intelligence, all the deep learning things that are happening? What's the next step? Yeah, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of talk about AI and ML, artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and um, deep neural networks and um, sort of these agnostic robots that analyze all the data and then just come up with insights that a human wouldn't because we wouldn't spend the time or effort or look at it from that angle. Uh, it's a huge field. And uh, you know that's an area that we're definitely partnering with folks who are experts in that area to help us understand how we can work together. You know, we've liberated the data, but unlocking value, uh, we're just starting that journey. Uh, and by the way, you know, I, I, I hope um, uh, you guys all realise how humble and how uh, you know Jim Collins' productive paranoia we have. Um, we're, we're in mile one of a marathon for healthcare informatics, for connected care, 
and for digital health. Um, we're very fit, but we're in mile one. And some of our competitors are just sort of starting the race. Um, some are tying their shoelaces and some are starting, but this is a long race and we're gonna need a lot of partners who know AI and ML and we're gonna work with them and we're also gonna make sure we stay on the forefront of the latest technology to get the data to the cloud, to interact with the data to the cloud, to keep it secure and to unlock value across the sort of medical silos and disease state silos for patients because Patients want it all and they, they want to be able to interact with it. They don't want to say, oh, there's my respiratory problem, there's my cardiac problem, there's my diabetes problem. They want a whole problem solved and it gets pretty complex. But there's, there's not one player out there, despite what you see in the uh, advertising marketing side. There's a lot of great folks doing good things and working out how best to partner with them is the, is the challenge in AI and ML. Um, with the silent mass sleep disorder research, by the way. Huh? <laughs> um, what are the challenges that we face at the National Institute of Health is there is a wealth of data out there that resides in private companies. And trying to utilize that data and get those companies to develop data formats that are integrable across various platforms is quite a bit of a challenge. And you sort of started addressing that with the last answer, but um, you know, are there you know, current working groups that perhaps I could become aware of, or become introduced to, that, you know, I could reach out to. I was visiting with Quest Diagnostics about two years ago, and they have 400 million data points. And when I look at the NHLDI repository, which contains critical data from the Framingham study, which has been going on now for over 50 years, we don't even have 4 million data points. <laughs> right? So how can we get, you know, access for basic researchers to be able to utilize this, this great storehouse of data in a cohesive fashion and whether it's through the NIH, we do have initiatives to, to make that happen, or through uh, external private entity, that's fine, we don't care. But, you know, getting that crosstalk between these silos is so important, so we could address that a little bit. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. Uh, firstly, thank you to the NIH. All the fundamental basic research is fundamentally needed in every industry. And without the Sleep Heart Health Study, which was primarily NIH funded, uh, I wouldn't have any of the prevalence and epidemiology data that we have to have created this industry. Um, so th th that's fundamentally important. And there's actually an NIH study we're looking to do in COPD because we've done a lot in sleep apnea, but COPD is just sitting there and there's there's so much sick of those patients with lung disease and their frequent flyers in the ER. So um, put in a good word for the COPD study we're doing at NIH because that's about industry development. Um, yeah, look, we, we do a lot of philanthropy and just giving back to our community, whether it's in our local communities and K-12 education, equality of opportunity and making sure STEM is taught well uh, in all the um, cities that we do business in. And, and another area of philanthropy could be unlocking these data into research databases to uh, create new insights. And um, so I just, uh, I'm on the board of Advermed and I just got elected to a non-paid voluntary job to be the head of digital, uh, um, the head of the digital committee. Uh, I think it's called Advermed Digital and I'm the chair. So I'd love to talk to you afterwards about, because my job there is actually to reach across the aisle because you know I'm not a Republican or a Democrat, I'm an Australian. So um, I, I don't have, you know, people are like, what are you, I'm like, I got my driver's license in Massachusetts. They say, you're a Republican or a Democrat? I said, excuse me, I'm Australian. She said, oh, you're independent? I said, damn right, I'm independent. Um, so, but there at Advermed Digital, I've got to be reaching across the aisle for us, our competitors and people in different um, disease states and, and, and even people that do compete every day against each other and say, well, how can we get our digital data de-identified, of course, right? Because people click, I agree, knowing I've got trust. I'm going, to, I'm going to keep the names and all the detail way, way, way away over here. But de-identified you know, some random 45-year-old male from Southern California, um, I'll put that into the database. But it's got to be managed well. It's got to be managed in a, in a way that we feel that it won't be monetized by someone else because we paid to get it there, that someone else is making profit of it. If it's for non-profit and it's truly for development of humankind and making the world a better place, then we're all in. So I'll talk to you afterwards, but I'm hugely passionate about that stuff because it'll create a whole new generation of med tech companies and insights 
uh, that'll help us keep people out of hospital, save money from our 20% of our GDP on healthcare, um, that we can reinvest in growing our economies and wealth creation and quality of life for people. First off, thanks for accepting my LinkedIn connection request. No problem at all. Uh, my name is Matthew Bancourt. Um, I am one of those that suffer from sleep apnea quite significantly, unfortunately. Um, I'd like you to touch a little more on uh, when I recently just got the latest machine. Yep. The, I don't want to call it a threat, but the, the indication was that if you don't use the machine for that four hours, that the insurance companies will not pick up the cost of the machine. And I'm curious as to if ResMed is involved in that and, and your, your feelings on it. Well, it's not a threat, it's just the reality. The insurance companies, they will pay for it for the first three months, they pay a rental. After three months, if you don't hit that 470, 30, 90, four hours, 70% of nights, 30 day trailing period in the first 90 days, they will take the device away. It's not a threat. This is the government, CMS, and all the other private payers followed. Our job, I see our, our fundamental job, is to maximise the percentage of patients who get adherent by day 90. You saw in that study, we're getting up to 80, 90% adherence. Traditionally, it was like 50%. And by the way, you know, people come to our industry and say, gosh, 50% adherence. Well, it's because you've got that plastic and you've got to turn that thing on. And it is. I mean, this isn't just like taking a pill. This is more complex. But you guys are in this space, so I've asked this question a lot. You guys will probably know the answer, but you've all seen the New England Journal of Medicine study, I'm sure, looking at adherence in the pharmaceutical space. Six months after a heart attack, a heart attack, you get a prescription for three things usually, ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, calcium channel drug, maybe a diuretic. What percent of people do you think are just taking the first med from that cocktail that they were offered after a heart attack? ER, prescription, please take this. Six months later, what's the adherence rate? I'll take any guesses from 30, 50, 70, 10, 30, 50, 70, 90%. 30, 60, 50. Who said 50? That's correct. 50% of people take their pill. The other 50 say, I love that ambulance. That ER was great. The food was exceptional. I got a whole bunch of bacteria. 50% adherence, that's what the standard adherence rate is in CPAP. And it's pretty poor, but it's just like a, a pill. Uh, getting it to 87% is good. I prefer 99% or 99 point something, nine something, because some humans just won't do things for their own good no matter what you do. But most people will if you educate appropriately. So it's not a threat, it's true. If you're in your first 90 days, I'll get you in touch with some digital nurses I know and you will um, change your approach to it because it really is life and death, uh, getting this treated right if you look at the Sleep Path Health Study on uh, longevity. I'm Ed, Dave Shepard of MedWorld Advisors. Um, you obviously run a very global company. There are some aspiring entrepreneurs here that are trying to get into the market anywhere. Um, do you have any recommendations as if you, if you were starting today, would you start in the US, would you start in Europe, would you start in Australia? But what, what are your thoughts there? So this is a question much better for my father who actually founded the company and was the entrepreneur. You know, I'm the uh, hired gun that came in afterwards, share 50% of the DNA, but not that 50%. He's the entrepreneur. So you guys have got some special juice if you're the entrepreneurs, um, and I respect you. Um, my father would say it's not risk taking though. It's risk avoidance, opportunity maximizing. Um, a lot of people think entrepreneurs are risk takers. They're not, they know it's gonna work. They're trying to avoid all the, the risks. Uh, just having participated in different regulatory markets all around the world for medical devices, um, I'd say it would very much depend if it's an implantable or a non-invasive device or a diagnostic or a therapeutic. But in general, uh, there's much easier paths to market to get initial testing in, in other countries. Western Europe, particularly for um, what would be a 510k or a PMA here, a lot, lot of CE mark capability. By the way, Brussels is working on making the CE mark worse than the 510k process as we speak. So get in quick, but I would have traditionally said definitely Western Europe first, then here, because you get a developed market and then uh, get some proof of concept and not critical mass because you have socialized medicine and very low reimbursement rates. But if you get adoption there, you can then move to the volume markets of uh, North America. 
Um, it might be moving to Asia. You know, we, along with the Brighttree acquisition last year, we bought a company in China called Curative Medical. They were a competitor, but they make a product in China for China. So made in China, designed, made, manufactured, and sold in China. And um, by the way, we run our, a separate analytics platform there in China because Beijing needs the source code if you're going to run a cloud platform in China. So we're not giving our source code of our rest of the world. We wrote another source code and um, actually came with that acquisition. But um, I would consider China a great market for um, some areas if you've got the right disease state and the party in that province or territory is interested in treating that disease state. You can really get on some exciting things and we have really good relationship with the governments in China as we, as we grow that business. And um, it's just outside Shanghai and Suzhou, which is sort of the Silicon Valley for medtech, I think, in, in, uh, in China. So I'd, I would have said Western Europe, but I'd say get in quick for that. And if not, um, consider maybe uh, in, in the China, China area. And, and we have a huge innovation center based in Singapore. Um, again, based near all that hub of Asia Pacific, amazing uh, med tech. I mean, we have double degreed electrical mechanical engineers running production engineering for us in our manufacturing plant with all the robots in, in Singapore. Just incredible, incredible. Um, we have a partnership. Sounds crazy, but we have a partnership with the government of Singapore. We'll sit down there and we'll talk. We'll say we have an agreement through 2030 with them on how many engineers we're going to hire, what we're going to do to work with them. And um, I wish other governments would have that long-term view. Hi, uh, I'm Ezra Alexander, software quality engineer. And while Eric was speaking about cloud-based digitization, what's going through my mind was security, of course. But I was wondering, apart from the fact that you probably have proprietary software on, on your devices, um, is your cloud-based uh, solution proprietary or are you going for a third party? I, I don't know how much of this you could reveal because they might be competitors, but I assume with a lot of data, um, managing that could become out of control really fast for a company that's really designated to the device versus the cloud management. How are you balancing that and how do you hope to balance that in the long term? So I'll answer the question uh, in you know, if I was context rather than talk about a particular company like ResMed. If I was starting up a, a small, medium-sized company and looking to put my data in the cloud, I would probably consider partnering with Amazon Web Services or with Google Cloud. Um, they do it well, they do it cheaply, and they do it as securely as anyone else. Um, so I think there are some really good providers of those types of things out there. and. Um, I just heard from both of them this week on how good and cheap and secure they are. And um, you know they're probably the world leaders for that right now. And I think you'd be crazy to want to run your own back end, particularly uh, in the early stages. Hi, I'm Karen Iden. My questions relate to those who are not diagnosed. And they both pertain to percentages. The first percentage I'm wondering is what percentage of the population do you think has sleep apnea. And of that percentage, what percentage do you think go undiagnosed? Mm -hmm. And given that large, I suspect it's a very large number, how do you think, or how would you propose to increase the probability that those people will become diagnosed? How will people know to identify themselves that perhaps they should go to their doctor and get a diagnosis? Yeah, so three great questions. So the first one, it's 26% of the adult population. The prevalence is 26% of 30 to 70 year olds who have an AHI above five with symptoms or 15. So they either suffocate every 15 minutes or five minutes of sleep and they, or, or 15 with symptoms. So 26%, one in four adults, somewhere around 40 to 60 million Americans. Right now, diagnosed on treatment, somewhere around five, six million. So 85% undiagnosed and that's in the United States. And this is, sadly, the best country in the world for that diagnosis rate. It's lower than that in Western Europe, and it's much lower than that in Asia Pacific. In China, we're talking decimal percentage points of the population who are suffocating every night that are treated. What are we going to do about it? Um, you know, you've got to know what you're good at. You've got to know what you're not good at, right? So running 
uh, back-end cloud systems is probably better for a huge tech company that's running trillions of data points a second. Um, we're a really good medical device company, the best medical device company in the world for sleep apnea and COPD, and one of the world's leaders in digital med tech, uh, well, the world leader according to Berg Insight. What we're not good at is consumers, consumer marketing. You know, that's what Procter & Gamble does for a living. That's what other people do. And so we uh, learnt this the hard way. I've got a scar on my forehead. That's from my youth, but the, the metaphorical one I have is from when we bought a company in Ireland and tried to launch a consumer product that was about sleep wellness. And we did well. We had a good Christmas you know, uh, holiday season and, and sold a lot of product. And it got written up in the Wall Street Journal, Health Tech, number one sleep tracker in the planet, the S Plus by ResMed, a lot of press. But it sold well less than what I would consider a winner in my core business in terms of success. And, um, but I, I didn't want to lose that hope that there's 80% of people suffocating every night and they don't have any way of knowing. And it's a great just sleep wellness device that helps people sleep better with insomnia or with PLMS or RLS and gets them into the diagnostic channels for many other sleeping disorders. So we kept it on the back burner in just last year, actually earlier this year, we launched the new company, which is called Sleep Score Labs, and we spun it off. And we have a double digit equity stake. Pegasus Capital uh, has a double digit equity stake. And uh, Dr. Maimon Oz, Oprah's doctor, uh, when she was around, Dr. Oz uh, took a, an equity stake himself. He's not a paid spokesman, he's actually a shareholder and he's on the board of directors. And by the way, He's a cardiovascular surgeon and he puts on a great show of just talking folksy and let me talk to you about your disease. When he's negotiating in the boardroom, he does a good job. And um, so we have a very fair partnership um, and um, Sleep Score Labs will, um, I think, liberate data for millions of, potentially tens and hundreds of millions of sleepers and help them realize if they have risky breathing or shortness of breath, they need treatment for sleep apnea or COPD, but more important than that for that company, they're going to help them sleep better and live better throughout their whole life of sleep health. So for me, it's that sort of separation of church and state. I don't know, I hope we're the church and they're the state, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the medical side and the consumer side. Let's empower patients early with their own data. David Gallo from Sepik. Uh, I'm interested in your pricing the models, both from the point of view of your financial performance and also your customers, do they, I mean particularly for the digital services, uh, do they pay you for volume or for uh, outcomes or a combination of both? Yes, yeah, so it's a good question. Pricing is always a tough thing. And so the, the data that we give to consumers, to patients, is free. It's your data. In 30 or 50 states, I think legally you own it, we consider in 50 or 50 states you own your data. It's your breathing. Actually, we consider in 100 of 100 countries we sell in, you own your data. So we pay to liberate the data to the cloud. We pay for the chip. We pay for the airtime charges. We get it to the cloud. But once it's there, if you enter your, your serial number and you say, I want it, you get it. So patients get it free. Liberate the data, empower patients for free. I just think that's firstly the right thing to do. And secondly, what we find is if they use it, uh, if they use the data, they use the device more, and then they actually buy more product from us because we uh, sell ongoing products, you know, masks and accessories to those patients. And so patients get it free. Um, other parts of the healthcare, and, and, and similarly with the data, the doctor gets the clinical data for free. Doctor gets the clinical data for free. When we pay $800 million for a software as a service company that was already charging you money to operate your services for, for our customers, we kept those charges going and, and we, we will continue to invest in that company and, and, and improve the workflows, but we will be saving you know this much costs for those on the web, oh no, they can see me. Um, so this much costs, we'll be charging you know, this much for the, for the um, software as a service revenue so that there's profit and that profit is reinvested back by the customer. It's their cash flow, they reinvest it back, we hope for better patient care. And we're certainly seeing that. Those who are adopting cloud solutions of our customers are not only growing their bottom line, they're also providing better care, getting better adherence rates and better performance for um, hospitalization reductions and so on. And often that, that provider is also the hospital and they're looking to, and sometimes within Kaiser's case, also the insurance company. So they, they're really looking at reinvesting that for changing the healthcare system. 
Hi, Mac. I'm Jolie Gardner. I'm a usability specialist for medical devices. And this is actually a joint question for Chris and you, because I work with a lot of startup companies. And of course, digital data is the future. Everyone is talking about having their data in the cloud. But what I'd love to get from both of you at some point is your perspective on what is a motivating factor for companies to share their data with, with a larger national governmental audience for everyone's benefit? You talked about giving back to the community. Yes. Is that the motivator? Yeah, it's the, it's the only motivator. I mean, it's, you know, it costs money to get it there. Sharing it back with the person who owns it is no problem. The patient owns their data. It's theirs, it's free. But they actually get to choose whether we share it with anybody else. If they click no, you can't have it because it's theirs. If they click yes, then we have to work on, you know, across industry or across multiple industry methodology of making sure it's secure because I won't give it to you unless I know it's secure and that it's used for good um, and that it's used for mutual good, truly in a non-profit sense, that not, there's not some external third pro you know, party profit maximizing on stuff that we're throwing in there for free because I have no problem helping on a charitable cause but not your charitable cause for your mortgage or your yacht, you know, Mr. Startup in Florida or wherever. Um, it's got to be truly above board with great governance and well managed. Usually, you know, I think it's best done as a sort of cross industry non-profit. That's how some of the best sort of advocacy and uh, research groups have, have been set up. As I said earlier, I think that's a, a huge discussion for our industry. By the way, we're in mile one of the marathon. We don't even know how to use the data yet. So uh, we've got to work out the best way to liberate it, the best way to unlock value. But clearly, there are multiple methods to do that. And one of them is going to be working cross industry for um, uh, you know, the common problem we have, which is one in every five of the dollars that our gross domestic product producers it goes into healthcare and 80% of it is wasted on chronic diseases. Yes, hi, I'm Laura Chiama and I'm a pediatrician um, by training, focused in cellular molecular biology. So I say I was born and raised in sort of the hard sciences, worked with MIT doing global health technology innovation. And I hear and I understand entirely your comments about separation of church and state with you know the med side versus the consumer side. But what's really striking to me in terms of a company that has as much data as you do, certainly on the sleep side and what you can do with that, is even in the title of your talk, you talk about connectedness, trust, and patient behavior. And with what we're seeing now with health systems transformation, but also transformations in education and business and everyone else focusing on uh, the behavior aspect of this, right? I mean, the, the, the sorts of connectedness and trust issues. I would imagine that you're accumulating a whole lot of potentially very valuable information about the patient behaviors, not just their sleep outcomes. Have you thought about what you could do with that, or are you following that? Because again, you've said, even in, in, in speaking, that that was something that you were getting a lot of information about how they like their information, what they do with it, and how it changes their behaviors. Yeah, look, we're certainly, we're learning. We're, as I said, mile one of a marathon, we're learning a lot about how best to interact with, with our customers, and primarily the patients through this whole process. Um, I heard from the CEO of 23andMe uh, last week, and, and she was talking about how, how much people learn and love from their genetic data. And that's just, you know, one, one little uh, component of the additions that we could put in on that sort of more consumer side. And I watched their whole steps with the FDA where they went from sort of prior all the way down to actually being embraced by the FDA as a way to, to walk through that process. So I, I think government regulatory uh, folks are working through this process. I think companies like us who are early, I think, in the big data, actionable information steps are working through this. We truly don't know uh, what we're going to unlock from all this um, great potential here. Um, but I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I think every step you have to create value. You know, I run a for-profit company. I, if you just talk about, wow, what's this future going to be with all this stuff? And I hear companies doing this. I'm thinking, that's great. But what about next quarter? Can we do something? Can, we, can I give you something tomorrow morning that will help you sleep better? OK, let's do that and then iterate from there. So we're going to need some, some of that sort of 2020, 2030, 2050 thinking. And we're going to need some, hey, let's make sure the system doesn't break because 
we're trying to do too much before we actually work out the small stuff we can do to get a return from it. But don't worry, in our company, there's people, I won't give you the project names, but there's people thinking, oh, there's people thinking way too small. And so we, I think our job uh, is to find a balance and to find the right partners who are working through the long term. And, and some of them are, are governments, uh, and some of them are some great research, non-profit research groups that are out there thinking along, along that angle. I love your conference. It's got very much of a balance between the government, the, uh, the private, and all the different elements. Let's hear it from you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dave.